Welcome back to the second part of our story, Simon Massey, A Very British Brand. We've now reached the 60s. I was waiting for them to start in part one, and that was important for many reasons. You've met her, Janice Wainwright, the change maker. I was waiting for her to step into the company and you'll be treated to a kaleidoscope of outfits bearing the name of her label, Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey that have survived to the present day to tell our tale. You're going to be stunned by some of them, particularly if you've imagined what Tanya was wearing in part one. And they show how much of a change maker Janice really was. We're not sponsored by the shops that illustrate this story, but as a thank you, we've linked them down below in the description. Not all are still available though, folks, so wearable and collectible they are. So you know what to do if you want one. Like shoppers in the 60s, you better be quick and grab them before someone else does. And think while you do that buying these items is a bit like buying them from the house of Morel. You know now that Morel stocked one item and one item only. And if they had duplicates, made sure they were sold to people who didn't live near each other or were going to the same event. In the present day, they're usually the last ones left also one item only how does it feel to know you're the sole owner of a garment when you're wearing it hanging it in your wardrobe very carefully you're feeling the same as the fashionable women of Hull did when they left the house of Mirel and in honour of them you'll see Mira on the left and Molly on the right of each slide perennially busy in the running of Hull's famous fashion house Janice is so much a part of the Simon Massey story that had she known her future age 13, making those first sketches on paper, she would have seen them as arrows pointing in that direction from the start. She absolutely knew what she wanted. Setting her chin in the direction of Wimbledon Art School two years after that first lesson, then Kingston Art School, then fashion at the prestigious Royal Academy of Art. She dreamed of designing clothes since she was a child and had developed a flair and a head for business long before she became famous, painting her oval eyes in black winged liner, brushing a deep wave into blonde hair and slicked pink lipstick across the line of her mouth. This is just a run through of some of her key fashion collections, as well as what else was being designed at what became her business as well. Yep, she ended up buying it. As it's impossible to talk about all of them, we're going to start with a bit of background about what made her so successful. 1961 to 64, her years of training, was a febrile revolutionary time in fashion and she was influenced greatly by her brilliant tutor Janie Ironside, as were the other names around her. Look at who she studied with followers, Ozzy Clark, Sandra Rhodes and Bill Gibb, names that would soon send a thrill through the industry. Well, in comparison, Simon's Massey offering was, well, Let's say it was traditional. We can understand why. Look back at the first part of our story. What do you think the designers would have thought of the free flowing ideas of the new generation? The rules being broken. Do you think they would have accepted it easily? How about its impact on sales? Let us know in the comments if you remember this happening, the early 60s when everything started to change. If you were around, what were your favourite clothes? Whether you were there or not, the change we recognise so well from the position of the present pulsed around her in the streets of London as Janice walked through Mayfair in the kitten heeled shoes of the time while she was being told to use her imagination in the Royal School of Art, one day a week in her work placement at one of Britain's biggest names, she was told how to fit in. The meticulous way cutters cut cloth at Simon Massey, how textiles were bought and sold, and what the order books said were successful, as well as profit margins. It was an education, of course, but the Beatles was her soundtrack, the Who and the Stones, 
Her friends wore slender, pencil-thin skirts, sometimes ones rippling with pleats, the new fashion for drop waists and slender silhouettes of the time. They liked Mary Quant and matched blouses with Peter Pan collars to coats that were straight up and down. In her mind, fashion was different and Simon Massey knew it too. Recognition was instant and as soon as she graduated, she says she was snapped up by Simon Massey full time. And eight months after leaving college, she added in an interview in April 1985, the label Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey was first distributed so fast. What was going on? It wasn't the label that was faltering, was it? Interestingly, In the years I've researched their adverts, there is a noticeable gap in national advertising of Simon Massey between 1961 and 62, as if it's disappeared completely across England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Was that a cliff's edge for the business, I asked myself? Or maybe an artefact of what newspaper I was reading, but there were so many available I didn't think so. It just was so noticeable in comparison with the years prior. In Hull, as we said in part one, this was exactly the time that things were also evolving. Hammond stocking Simon Massey by 1957 was certainly a sea change in the relationship between these stalwarts and the House of Morel in the early 50s, its only stockist. Then in the gap between 1957 and 1963, something else changed again because this advert in September 1964 shows that Edwin Davis, another family run business with over a hundred years of retail tradition in Hull, were stocking, quote, many exciting styles to choose from by Simon Massey, London Maid and Alexon. Tying together brands with Simon Massey that a decade earlier in 1954 just wouldn't have been thought of in the same breath. If you're not from Hull and curious, go to House of Morel UK and type Edwin Davis into the search bar to see its red brick building now sadly demolished and learn more about Hammond's by doing the same. Was Edwin Davis's advert showing us something about where Simon Massey was positioned in 1964? Was it a sign that mass production was taking over? And could Janice have got her job just in the nick of time? It was obvious that someone there recognised what she represented to fashion. Her style was fluid, blissfully unrestricted by tradition, except the tradition of selecting fine fabrics and embellishing them with embroidery and needlework. Something years later in 1972, when she set up her own label at number 47 Poland Street, would be a trademark of her designs. In her first job, though, she was immediately important. Across the design tables and meetings of her student years, at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street, she really made an impression. She was 20 in 1960, not far behind Mirelle's staff like Tanya, who you met in part one. Although Tanya's suit with its wide reverse and pearlized buttons would not be the fashion for young people anymore. No corsets restricted them into hourglass lines. A sign of knowing it, the showroom girls at Mirelle like Tanya, often left Mirelle to work at other outlets in Hull, like at the leader of off-the-peg clothing C&A, which in 1960, around the time La Boutique opened, appeared on the corner of Ferrens Way in Hull, close to Hammond's. With quick change fashions made in bulk, sold off the peg, and each line shipped to every store in Europe, Do you remember what it was like to shop there? And does the sound of that shop remind you of any modern ones? Let us know. You can also see much more about CNA Hull in the locations which is on this channel. Reports say that Janice Wainwright and her own label appeared on the landscape in 1965. And for a few years, we can see in surviving adverts that there was Simon Massey, the label, and Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey running in parallel, which helps to date designs like the ones coming up. Who will win? 
who will win the race to the future, I asked in the Maureen's Memories video. It's, it's linked down below. These are the clothes you see have, that have survived to the present day telling her story and those of the label Simon Massey as well, so stick around. But it was more that fashion that was changing, life was too. Young women still left school at 15 and if they got their first job, it paid on average a £1,000 a year, about 14000 in 2023. The average woman on an average wage saw their attitudes changing towards fashion. They demanded clothes that didn't accrue extra expense in dry cleaning or time in washing and ironing like we saw in part one. And with that, places that sold off the peg like CNA became more and more popular, as did synthetic fabrics, ones with patterns on them that didn't fade like they did on natural silks, satins or cottons. This is really important to understand before we look at Simon Massey in the 60s. With less expense came more freedom. You could keep the new styles. They lasted, or throw them away if you wanted. No mending, no darning, not wasting pounds and pounds. Some were drip dry and some you didn't even have to iron. The culture was changing. You could choose more than one outfit per season that before off the peg arrived. You paid a lot of money for this season's design and then wore it and wore it to death, as Raymond Zelka, owner of Polly Peck, said. You met him in Maureen's Memories. So, as we also said in Maureen's Memories, fashion was going through a revolution as Janice Wainwright appeared at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street, no longer as a student, now full-time, intently focused on being the change maker we see herself to be. Within what seems like minutes, she'd made her mark. Roughly speaking, Janice was the lead designer from 1965 through to the last collection in autumn, winter 1971, by which time she bought the company as well. But the story we started in part one was about many women and she wasn't the only one there. There were others in the background as well. Reports from Nottingham University in May 1970 says graduates also secured jobs at the firm and in 1973, after Janet's departure, a Welsh fashion designer, Anna Roos, recalls working there after graduating from the Royal Academy in London, the same as Janice. Maggie Derrick at Simon Massey, making a duck egg blue dress with daisies on the neckline in 1964. And Anne Starsmere, another designer, said she was just a little assistant designer at Simon Massey during the swinging 60s. But Janice might as well have been the only designer in town. She was certainly the one who was featured and talked about in the press most often, usually because of how incredibly modern were her designs. The labels you'll see here are mostly by Janice, by the way. And after leaving in autumn, winter 1971, helps put them all together into a clear time frame, 1965 to the end of 1971. Let's start with where fashion was in 1965, although in later news reports, some say Janice had been at the firm for eight years on leaving, which would have meant she started in 1963. Miles away in Hull, through the doors of the House of Mirel at 11 Story Street and Lamb Boutique on Anleby Road, boxes still arrived bearing the label Simon Massey, and they did at Edwin Davis and Hammond's, but down in London. Op art, the black and white patterns of avant-garde artists influenced textile design and what emerged from the boxes was a toss-up between the traditional under the Simon Massey label and the revolutionary now saying Janice Wainwright. In 1965, a new group focusing on off the peg, you'll remember what that was from our locations talk, called the Associated Fashion Designers of London, which I'll call the AFD, had been going for 18 months. And in 1965, press reports say that over a thousand buyers from all over the world descended on London to see off the peg collections from Rona Roy, Mono, Hildebrand, J. 
John Marks, Wallace, Carl Friedman, Ricky Reed, Harbro, Andre Peters, Mark Russell, and Simon Massey. Janice knew her designs would be taken all around the world as we've seen in part one and we will also see later so stay tuned. Here's a description of a Simon Massey label outfit from May 1965. Figure flattering, it's ideal for the more mature woman for whom a shift is out of the question, it says, talking about a style which removed the waist straight up and down, also saying it goes up to size 42, which is a hip measurement, by the way. It bridges the gap between the tatty cottons and garden party silks, which seems to monopolise the designers these days. Sounds safe and suitable for every woman, doesn't it? This type of outfit would go down well in Edwin Davis department store, where it could be ordered from the firm in whatever quantity was needed. They didn't sell singly like the House of Mirel. That market, the market for fashions for the over 30s was still there, you see. And we'll see this in the top 30 collection. But it's not what Janice was there for, no siree. A year earlier, Andre Courage, the Parisian designer, raised headlines and by now young women all over were asking for crop cuts with sharp points like those cut by Vidal Sassoon. But it was bang slap in London first, then all over the country that the mini skirt was seen over and over and raised headlines for years afterwards. I've got a picture of a Mirel fashion show in March 1970 where all the front row is showing what Mirel model Mary Johnson called quite a lot of leg. So in 1965, when Janice sat down at her desk to imagine the new season statement piece, this influence ran through her mind. Not garden parties or older women, the market for their other designs. Op art, a huge trend. How to introduce it, she'd have thought. Well, it started with the fabric. Although Janice herself did design textiles for the company, it was more usual that she'd buy pieces commissioned by textile designers like Anthea Davis, as we'll see in 1970, with a dreamy, beautiful elements collection coming up. They also bought Ulster-made fabrics from Northern Ireland, like linens, a type of thick cotton, and man-made fibres also, some exhibited in Manchester and Sheffield in March 1966, where companies that bought their lines were mentioned, including Simon Massey, but also Dorville, another famous British brand, and Susan Small, which you can see in our video on her label, Polypecti, which you'll remember from Maureen's memories. So there was competition. The textiles were important. New ones coming in like Tricel and Banlan, man-made fibres constructed from chemical processes, cheaper and easier to manufacture and certainly for the workroom girls at Mirel a new challenge. They were used to altering nat natural fabrics in the main and you didn't want the competition buying up a fabric you particularly wanted, so distinctive and essential was it to a design particularly true in this dress, wouldn't you agree? How well it's used to effect, showing a real awareness of how to design to show it off by Janice. To buy fabrics meant getting them in really large quantities, as Raymond Zelka, the owner of Polypec, said, and that meant producing and selling it in quantities in order not to produce wastage. Although the company address was at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street, Simon Massey's production had moved into a factory in Scotland, no longer making up in the workrooms in small quantities. And this helps to explain why in its later years, in the late 60s and 70s, it was described as a Scottish firm, something we queried in part one. Designs had to be easy to make, machined by women there behind rows and rows of industrial sewing machines and out in the shops across the UK quickly and beyond to recoup a profit, which was a very different model of working than the single item made to one's measurements, ordered and stocked at the House of Morel that you know about from part one and Maureen's memories. It's really worth a pause to think about this. Boy, wasn't Maureen right? 
the 60s was so different from the 50s in these aspects of making and marketing good quality clothing. Now we know why a new broom was necessary to sweep through fashion design and Janice was no fool. She knew exactly how to make the most of her experience and business acumen. Profit was important, but so, so was stamping her identity on the firm and its designs. By the time this dress went into production to be in the shops for spring summer 1965, their publicity department was churning out press releases with photos like this one you see here from January. She'd have known this dress was making a statement. Made in Tricel Georgette, a synthetic version of a fabric originally made from silk, think saris, like that, it was therefore far less expensive and labour intensive for the firm and wearer alike. Flicking through advertorials and photos, it would have been clear that Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey was going for the younger, funkier, more adventurous market. Those who could afford the eight guinea price tag also remember how much a guinea was? Well, it would be around £129 today. The swells and whirls were a pointer and a statement saying, I've arrived. Let's see what else was on sale during this year and beyond. It's also very noticeable that throughout the 60s and in the designs you'll see here, it's synthetics like Banlon, a crimped nylon yarn invented in 1954 that I mentioned, or Dicel, made by the textile company Courtauld's Britain, rather than the woolens like Barathea you'll remember from part one. Later on, when Janice had left Simon Massey, she'd say she disliked all synthetic fabrics like the ones used in these designs except rayon which was also known as art silk she added but they made their mark and on exports a money-making machine by the October 1966 AFD it was reported that members had trebled their exports to over one and a half million pounds and we'll see one particular item that ended up in America as you did in part one by then, a new colour palette had emerged miles away from Oppart. I think this dress might come from around then. Its rolled collar and shorty short shift shape a trend and a nod to Italian fabrics. In 1968, two years later, the textile company Cortel was said to have printed an Italian print used by Simon Massey. And in the locations on this channel, I talk about the Italian designer Pucci using this slide. Bright pink abstract shapes, colours that almost clash, are a trend from designers inspired by Pucci. Although the dress is simple, it's the fabric that you notice that would be immediately apparent and there's more besides. One length would be made into patterns that are simple to cut very cost effective for the manufacturer due to how little there is of it and relatively easy to make up with no sleeves, one zip down the back and a rolled collar for added complication. The shift dress really did surge forward the possibilities of mass manufacturing lots of highly desirable garments in standout fabrics that would be bought over and over again. By October 1966, a new colour palette was fashionable, up art forgotten for that of blossom white, pale green and touches of pink. Better get a new dress, such a different look would have generated further purchases and kept sales coming. Deep purple as a shade had been around in April, along with flame orange, ginger, ginger, aubergine and yellow. And that reminds us of this dress. Made in a textured brocade velvet with a V neckline, it's quite classic and a bit psychedelic hippie too. The seller listed it alongside this photos of models, including Twiggy. 
With a pure Simon Massey label in it, ornately designed like the famous one by Bieber, a brand famous in the 60s and 70s, it doesn't mention Janice Wainwright. Again, although simple in design and construction, it's the fabric that really stands out, doesn't it, everyone? This could be much later than 1966, of course, but you can imagine wearing it with all sorts of hippie accessories like long boots, a ginger coloured scarf and a big floppy hat. I don't know about you, but I felt that this could be worn in the 80s as well. Was Simon Massey the label still around then, though? Stick around and you'll find out. Made in the light green voile so fashionable in autumn, winter, into spring, summer 1967, you can see the AFD being discussed on the left-hand side of this article and also on the left, another Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey dress. Worn in the 70s and the original owner's favourite, it's the pale green shade and use of floaty bias cut panels of fabric like horizontal frills and ties that remind us so much of each other as well as the style and length. Advertised at nine and a half guineas, if you work out how much that is, now you know what a guinea is, let us know in the comments. These dresses were advertised as being made from foil. That's a sheer fabric that's almost transparent. You can see how this needed lining in it to protect the wearer's modesty as well as how important it was that tights had been invented by then. We'll come back to mini skirts when we see culottes becoming fashionable, so stick around. But I was struck by how long this dress had been kept for, well over 50 years, long after the owner wore it. I've talked before about the biography of outfits, what the clothes tell us, and again and again in these slides, you'll see how value meant more than how much the owner paid for it. It had memories and emotions attached to it as well. In early 1967, an article mentions the Simon Massey 21 group which is a name a bit like the Ginger Group, which some of you will already know, was the name of a lower priced ready to wear range established by Mary Quant in 1963. Isn't it fascinating how some ideas spark others, influencers influencing the culture of fashion long before Instagram was invented? Was this the reason why the 21 Group was established to ride that wave followers? What do you think? But early 1967 was known for another fashion-shaped bunny pulled out of the hat, which is so incredibly different again. Following the designer Marc Bohan in France, who'd adopted African fabrics for his January collections, Janice took the trend and designed what was hailed as a truly fun collection. And here you see the newspaper advert and article printed in March 1967, although adverts were rolling as early as February that year. If it's not easy to read the print, let me tell you a bit about what it was in this collection that was considered to be so fun. Using a textile designed by Bernard Ferrers, the collection used African traditional dress, kangas, boo-boos and also Java prints. Each outfit was called something different and printed in many strong, vibrant colourways, which means a lot of different combinations of colours. And each kanga had a message in Swahili printed into them saying things like, eat grapes and love will linger or my sweetheart returns, my heart is calm. These two are the Java design, which you saw in the advert in jade green and white. It's really cut to maximise the textile, isn't it, viewers? And you can also see that it's lined in contrasting colours, all in all a real talking point. And Massey snapped this textile up and thought of many ways their investment in this textile could be used. I'm going to hold my hand up at this point and say I'm not an expert on African fabrics. I'll leave that to people who really know their stuff. So what I'm going to say is a short run through of its history. There's a huge amount of cultural significance here, as big as the continent itself. It's impossible not to look at these dresses and wonder about them and see the culture. It is so different when compared 
to the light green voils of the previous season. So I'll talk about the Kanga, which is a colourful fabric worn by both men and women, usually sold in a separate oblong about one and a half metres by one metre, with a border printed around the edge and a design in the middle. Printed on cotton, they're often sold in pairs and can contain messages or proverbs. And they're often used as gifts or made into a headdress or used as skirts or essential to handling pots or pans in cooking and loads more besides. On the east coast of Africa, they have a different significance where they're given as gifts on birthdays, for instance. The earliest type of kanga containing spots and speckles inspired by a guinea hen bird like you see in this dress. And the guinea hen is a kanga, by the way, where that word comes from. Adverts suggest the designs would sell for about five guineas and you know what a guinea is now so can work out the cost. And if you do, let us know in the comments. It's a fascinating knot to the cultural history where two were brought together that we can show you two side by side here. We do know the press liked them for their individuality, but not whether the modern day ethical concerns about cultural appropriation were in people's thinking in late 1966. Perhaps if you know, you could tell us. But by mid-1967, during the summer of love, things had moved on again. Before we get to the next big trend, and this one's inspired by cinema, let's think about where we're at. It's clear from many of the articles of the time that editors and contributors think trends like these have really been designed for the under 30s. And we can see from the clothes you've already seen that they're mostly above the knee, some way above it. And it shows a lot of the wearer's bodies. I mean, you can imagine Twiggy in them, right? And many contributors who've given these images to sell mention they were worn first by their mothers, then themselves hanging on to them for generations because they loved them like heirlooms. But one woman added she was selling hers because she couldn't fit into it anymore, which raises the question that aside from what's fashionable, are they practical though as you go through life past the age they were targeted at? What about what we'd wear today? Well, we're soon going to see how trousers influence fashion for women, which arrived in 1967. But for now, how did Simon Massey respond to these new trends? Although Janice is clearly represented in the photos we're showing you, was that all that was going on? Had they forgotten the same women who bought their clothes in the 50s? What about the mothers who often came in with their daughters when they bought clothes from the house of Mirelle? Were they left out in the cold as packing box after packing box arrived? Well, no, it wasn't the only thing happening. I said at the beginning that it's impossible to show you all of Simon Massey's clothes, and I'm really focusing on ones remaining in the present day telling their tale. But the brand overall did respond to the changes we've talked about here, and the division between fashions for what was described as over 25 year old women and fashions for those younger. They created a top 30 collection, which I'll talk about in a moment. It was age in the 60s that became the new dividing line of what was appropriate to wear. It's clear in October 1966, while Janice would have been sketching out the African collection, Massey's publicised what they called the top 30 range that was targeted at people over 25. Top 30 probably referring to the music charts, by the way, Top of the Pops, you'll remember, was a huge hit in British television. The description of one Quote, black dress, distinguished colours, classic skirts, about 14 guineas, paints a picture miles away from the African prints and voils. And along with clothes like the ones in this description that will sound more traditional, quote, striking Grecian style pre pleated evening dress, full length and off the shoulder in cyclamen pink nylon at 12 guineas and, quote, a lovely little Simon Massey dress, accordion pleated black chiffon with a plain bodice and long trumpet sleeves at 12 guineas, 
both from October 1967 straight after the Summer of Love, sound much more like the style and prices of old. In these, Janice wasn't mentioned. I don't think it was her label. So perhaps those other designers had a hand, the graduates of Nottingham University, Anne Starsmere, Maggie Derrick or Anna Roos, who I talked about earlier. So although surviving garments you see here in press reports suggest the attention was very much on the flashes of inspiration and groundbreaking work of Janice Wainwright, there were other things going on and they were catering to the whole market women of all ages and stages of life. And that would be seen in the buying and selling practices at Mirel also. It's fun, I think, at this point, to step back to part one of this story, where we saw outfit after outfit given names. Remember Goodwood? Also suggesting where it could be worn? Well, <laughs> this wasn't forgotten either. I was so touched to see in October 1967 a collection of late day wear, unusually naming an occasion to wear it in 1967 rather than an age, way back like when time of dress day dressing was so important and you'll know about what that is from our podcast on the topic. And the names will be significant to the coming new trend as they suggest the 30s and 40s too. Garbo after the actress Greta, Lamar, after Hedy Lamar. Rogers was in there also after the famous actress Ginger who acted with Fred Astaire and Harlow after Jean Harlow as well. Made in crepe, moiré and chiffon with sequins and ostrich feathers as embellishment. Don't they sound incredibly glamorous and real, non-synthetic versions too? But they also suggest the golden age of cinema and we'll come back to the 30s as a retro trend very, very soon. Let's return to the surviving garments. And in case you've forgotten, we're in 1967, the year of the summer of love. What sort of fashion do you think of when you think of this year almost 60 years ago? Well, let's look at some more designs that have survived. Massey did also sell furs, something I've not seen in any advertising across any time period, by the way, even in the years we covered in part one. And this raccoon fur was Simon Massey sold in America. I think more likely to be 70s. Look at those leather bound buttons and the way the lining is designed and attached inside. Working furs in itself is expensive and complicated, but you can really see all layers of the processes here. Although faux furs had been around since the 50s, marketed as cheaper and sometimes more flamboyant in colour, cut and shade, it shows us that real fur was still fashionable. But was it as contentious and regulated as it is today? It was in December 1968, the year following, that I found the first news reports about Beauty Without Cruelty, an organisation founded to promote how to dress without the use of real furs. They were staging a fashion show in London. For now, though, the culture hadn't changed. My thought is that if in this era it was missing from the wardrobes of the under 25s, it was more about cost and whether it fitted into fashion. So you, if you could afford it and wanted one like the original owner of this coat, you would buy it. And yes, the House of Morel stocked furs as well, in case you're wondering, as you'll know from our showroom videos. I'll link the hour long version which mentions Nobel Furs in London, the furrier with a special relationship to the House of Morel below. And here's another item, a jacket which when I first saw it shouted 1967 or 1968, flower power and hippie psychedelia at the upper part of my mind. With one label only, Simon Massey, it was created by the other designers. Again, isn't it really striking in its use of colour? Let's pause for a moment and have a bit of fun. If you were at the House of Mirelle, who would you have sold this to? Can you see her? Mirelle had a client list they'd phone 
to suggest clothes to, like personal shoppers, or people would walk in and browse at La Boutique, flicking through the rails. You learned about these in the locations and showroom videos. What age is the shopper you're thinking about? What size is she? And what budget does she have? And what occasion is she wearing it at? If you've imagined her and have answers, you're thinking like a showroom girl, so tell me what you thought in the comments. I think it was for a woman who might not have got into flower power fully, no hippie boho gypsy clothes, jangling jewellery and long natural flower strewn hair for her. She'd have seen the trend and wanted something about it that could be teamed with classic colours. There's yellow and turquoise blue in the fabric, but also a dash of rose pink on black, which grounds both of them. You could wear it with jeans, although they come into popularity a bit later, or trousers, or a slinky black maxi dress. And talking of maxis, here they come along with trousers. Let's put a placeholder in November 1967 when one headline shouted, the mini is over, maxis are on their way. The news reports of the latter part of the year into early 1968 were correct. Have you thought about what films were released in 1967? Take a moment to pause this video and go off and Google it. Are you back? Which one stands out from your research? If you found Bonnie and Clyde, a film starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, you're right. Press report after press report talks about how 30s and particularly this film is influencing fashion by drawing hemlines downwards and lengthening the outline. And at the same time, another trend happened, introducing trousers and trouser suit sets onto the fashion landscape, which you saw in that picture of Twiggy in the slide. One article I read in passing said that trousers were slowly becoming more acceptable for women to wear out to dinner. Isn't it shocking to hear that was something worth mentioning? But it's a sign that those time of day rules and expectations of dress were still in people's thinking, as well as expectations of the way genders would present themselves. But by now, culottes were becoming fashionable. Mini culottes particularly, I think, a natural reaction to the shortness of mini skirts, to be honest, much more wearable like trousers were. And the trend lasted for a few years. And that's where this dusky pink culotte suit comes from. It's prior to Janice leaving at the end of 1971, but couldn't you wear it today? But the big theme at the end of 67 was the lengthening of skirts down to maxi length to the ankle, or at least midi halfway down the calf, particularly fashionable in 1970 to 71, as it is at the moment. Back then, the start of the new decade and the big change at Simon Massey a couple of years away, as it was at the House of Mirel. Something else happened in 1968 in Hull also. Another House of appeared. If you're watching as a Hullensian and were in Beverly, which you'll remember from part one at the time, can you remember what that House of was? It wasn't the House of Mirel Mark II, not like La Boutique. Stick around because I'll tell you in a minute. Bonnie and Clyde really did have an impact, or at least the thought and ideas of the past did. If you're not into 30s fashions, I'll link the page to Mira's website down below. She owned the House of Mirel, which gives you a run through of the main trends of that decade. Here are two dresses which are already sold, by the way. The short paisley shift on the left from 1967, the long maxi on the right, a hint of what was to come, designed by Janice Wainwright. Aren't they so different in style? There was a beautiful, romantic, retro Edwardian aesthetic that took people into 1968, 
Think of the front cover of the Beatles, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and the band suits they're wearing. India and Morocco influenced textiles and ornate, often brocade suits were constructed for women with suit jackets and matching trousers in opulent, exotic textiles. And by summer, we think this dress had been invented, or at least the textile. Without a Janice Wainwright label, what I call pure Simon Massey, it's got that brightly coloured psychedelic look in a really eye-catching fabric that makes us think of Yellow Submarine by the Beatles, which was released the same year. Look it up if you're not familiar. Maxi dresses like this one really came into their own in 68. Usually with an empire line, that means a seam under the bus. It was actually quite a simple design. Straps, two panels for the bodice front and back, and a gently flaring skirt length, really good for summer and very wearable now. We see it at a festival, not a muddy one, perhaps one on a beach or with short grass. I haven't forgotten to tell you in case you're hanging on to hear about it. So here it is. The second house of, by the way, that appeared in 1968 was the House of Pepe, which advertising in the Hull Daily Mail of October 1968 shows that they thought of the same idea as Mira Johnson. They definitely weren't the same business. They had nothing to do with each other. But as you can see, it also stopped Simon Massey, though, and was run by a Miss Beryl. Look at the bottom right. In part one, I talked about Beverly, about four miles away from Hull and its relationship to its big shopping district in the centre of the city. And at the end of Maureen's memories, you can also find out which store in Beverly won the race to the future that I talked about as well. Puffing into Paragon Station, the train connected both and even today, they're different in size, scale and shops. Did you go shopping at the House of Pepe followers? Let us know what it was like in the comments or on our socials. Everyone says there was zero competition to the House of Morel. There was nothing like it. Was the House of Pepe close to it, though? And do you think they were trading on the success of the House of Morel by borrowing the House of Name? We're now in 68, going on 69. By autumn, winter 68, the spring, summer 69 collections are being created. Remember that purple maxi on this slide? Well, that's an Edwardian Victorian style design, which really came into the forefront in the latter part of the 60s. By now, Janice had bought the company and in June 1968, she was quoted as saying that a tunic and trousers were her favourite things to wear. It also says that Simon Massey is an Ayrshire firm, which is a part of Scotland. It's not clear whether at this time they're working out of six Upper Grosvenor Street or a hybrid between there and Scotland. I assume it's probably that the factory is in Scotland and the base is in London, because as we know, Mayfair was the centre of the British fashion industry. But I might be totally incorrect. And Simon Massey, about Simon Massey from around now, maybe it should be attributed to Scottish. So um, let me know if you can help us understand that. As Miss Beryl asked for her advert to be printed in September 1968, Janice let the world know about a new collection based on the dancer Isadora Duncan, who was famous, or should that be infamous, for wearing loose, flowing, dramatic clothes that unfortunately also brought about her death. Google her if you want to know why. Named the Isadorables, it consisted of a series of matching separates, which is a term meaning clothes that can be worn with each other or separate from each other. Think a blouse and trousers, which you can team with lots of other things. The Isadorables collection had one outstanding feature, though. Can you see it in this advert from the Hull Daily Mail on the 30th of January 1969? Not only was there a wide, ling wide leg trousers like big flowy flares, but there was also a detail around the waist like a cummerbund. And from that, long tassels were hanging. One news report said 
this collection had a turban included, which when unwound was like yards and yards and yards of cloth in length. This tunic has sold, by the way, but we're really sure it was part of the Isadorables collection. It's the tassels that make it so distinctive and was talked about often in the adverts. The advert was not the last in from the area about Simon Massey, by the way, but again, not from the House of Morel. In Hessel, on the foreshore of the River Humber, the river that Hull is built on, this advert said a fashion show was, quote, provided by a Hessel boutique, which unmistakably refers to a boutique called Dorothea Bell, which will be new to anyone watching, but not if you come from Hull. Unlike the House of Mirel or the House of Pepe, Dorothea Bell is still trading today, so you can go visit. And we've left their socials in the description box as well. Very much also in a story about fashion and hull from the years Morel was open. We're giving them a nod because so many models who work for the hull owned Holton Gray agency and modelled at Morel also either worked or modelled there, like this lady called Shirley Coates you see in this photo. Towards the later years, Dorothea Bell was often remembered in conversations with me alongside Mirelle as a type of statement boutique with the same cachet and stock and like Samantha's in Hull, which is owned by Maureen from Maureen's Memories, one that's left standing and we've also linked their website below. We don't know the label Shirley's modelling in this picture and I'll link the showroom videos that mention Holton Gray below if you'd like to meet Shirley and the other models who work tirelessly around Hull and the surrounds displaying clothes in person at fashion shows like this. Before we leave the 60s, this advert in Ecru, a type of grey, and has a similar 30s vibe with loose wide trousers like the trousers we saw underneath the tunic with the tassels in 68 and long sharp collars this time with a deep yoke. That's the semicircle from the shoulders circling around the bust and going up to the other shoulder again, putting this very much nearer to or into the early 70s. It is designed by Janice Wainwright at Simon Massey so it had to be in the shops before the end of 71 when she left to establish her own business. She did, folks, yes. More on that in a minute. Also appearing around the same time, you'll notice this is more of a hybrid of an evening gown and the 30s aesthetic. Imagine if you can, instead of being made in this distinctive synthetic brown and turquoise fabric, it's made from satin or silk. If made in those fabrics, we're looking more at a 40s design, but the different fabric dates it to the late 60s or early 70s. But don't you think it really picks up on that retro feel? It also hints at the colour associated with the 70s, brown. The 30s look influenced fashion right into the 70s in cosmetics, style and interior design also. And brown and shades of it came straight from the 30s and 40s when that other retro trend was also established. You'll probably remember or have seen this in adverts, but glossy romantic lipstick and high arching eyebrows plucked to oblivion, messy curls and long straight skirts with heeled boots of the early 70s are particularly seen in 1970 to 71. And they are all borrowed from the 30s and 40s aesthetic. But it's in 1970 we see how textile and collection are intertwined. Designed by Anthea Davis and made in Tricell, which you'll remember was one of the big brand synthetics, and appearing in the adverts of early 1970, saying, in the shops around March. This was a very famous collection, talked about as Earth or Elements collection in the press. And as you can see, it has a dreamy oriental influence, like ancient Japanese arts, this photo was taken by Liz Eggleston, by the way, the one accompanying the listing in eBay. But there's also this one, which really shows off the collection by Jim Lee, 
Thanks to Liz Tregenza for all the information about this textile and that picture. Her big book's linked below, by the way. She's the go-to doctor about all things wholesale couture. She comments that although Anthea Davis also designed for the very famous Bieber, very little is published about her, which we think is such a shame because she clearly was an influential and talented designer. So if you know more, please do get in touch or comment on our socials. Once commissioned and bought in textile form, the Elements collection was made of many multiples, tunics, trousers, maxis, long cardigans, hot pants, all separates, which you'll recognise was a flexible, interchangeable way of designing and wearing clothing. You can see in this photo by Liz Eggleston, excuse me, how the model on the left is wearing it with cream coloured trousers, for instance. Bearing the Janice Wainwright label, it was her who bent over her desk, imagining how best this textile could be used, what would sell and become popular. If you're thinking she had to maximise the cost and quantity of this fabric, then I think you're right. Making it into many different designs did just that. It maximised the amount of clothes that could be sold from it. You could buy a maxi like this one and team it with a cardigan, or you could buy this tunic and wear it on its own, or team it with trousers. The possibilities were endless, and you'll remember this trend for tunic and trousers was Janice's favourite from 1968. Unfortunately, we don't have access to the company records for Simon Massey to know what shape the company was in after Janice bought it and made decide decisions like these. But as you can see, the label still had a cachet, a reputation, a presence, but all was not well behind the scenes. Later on in 1974, when all was said and done with Simon Massey, Janice was interviewed by the Scotsman newspaper. By keeping clothes down to a price in the showrooms of Simon Massey cramped her style, they said. What was going on that tore at the heart of her design ethic? Well, can you see how these designs diverged from the all-important fabric she was inspired by? Her sense of detail and the embroidery and applique that characterised the collections she'd devised at number 47 Poland Street the location of her new company on the south side of Oxford Street near Susan Small and Dore Leventhal, both also stalwarts of British design. Let's look at the last remaining examples of her clothing under the Simon Massey label while we think about the later years she had at the helm. This dress, owned by Liz Tregenza, is made with another dark tone fabric in a repeat floral pattern of natural greens and creams on black, and this time it's semi-transparent, which you can see in its flutter sleeves, the long trailing open sleeves, and would have been late 60s, early 70s. But this dress, folks, has another story attached to it. As you'll have seen, there are many outfits, single examples that have survived over the years and kept by original owners, some like the lime green dress and kanga, favourite outfits, ones that had sentimental value as well as, well as a respected label. But... Only one is available of those that we're aware of, except this one. Uniquely, this one has two examples left in the world and was recently on Instagram by at Hope and Harlequin, link below. You can see how it looks on the body, how romantic and floaty it is. Connected in with the ears of Simon Massey clothing, Liz says she's seen other examples of this print with the Janice label in it, but we'll have to imagine what they look like unless someone watching out there has something special in their wardrobes. Something like the green voile dress or kanga passed down through the generations or a magical discovery in a garage sale or a charity shop. Look, don't throw them away. They're part of fashion history. Make sure you hang on to them or at least find a reputable seller if you want to pass them on. At the end of 1971, Janice left Simon Massey to establish her own company, naming it 47 Poland Street after the address buyers like Mira and Molly and first sales Judith would have arrived at for meetings and buying trips. But it was not the end of the brand. 
Turning the clothes to the inside, labels got smaller. Sizing was introduced and fabric care labels also a legal requirement that we recognise today. The bedrock of current fashion really started in the 70s and these outfits show you how flexible an offering it was, that synthetics were now routine, that lines were for the every woman, that they were held on to because they were from a good label, but also that they could be worn in many situations or occasions at work, home or play. When asked by a journalist in August 1972, designer Gillian Thorne said she didn't have a favourite designer like Quant or Simon Massey. Of course, I've heard of them, but I don't follow them, she said. And it was a sign of changes to come. Newspaper reports and adverts show Simon Massey continuing to trade afterwards right up until this advert in 1984 from the Litchfield Mercury, none from Hull, I'm sorry to say, since 1969. Look how throwaway it is, how simple the description. Simon Massey skirts, a bland, non-descriptive description. Admittedly, the name Simon Massey still spoke to a legacy, but New trends and fashions were around and time of day dressing, which you'll know from our podcast, was a reason to buy something new in the 40s, 50s and 60s was really falling away. And casuals, jeans, matching tops, a smart skirt or a dress for work, something nice for a lunch or dinner date, all these were becoming the norm. Here's a photo from a Mirelle fashion show in September 1976, two years before they closed. Jill Bradley, owner of Holton Grey Agency, on the left is wearing a neat skirt suit but June Gibson sitting and Carol Carr in the hoodie on the right are wearing what epitomises the casual look. At Mirel though people you can assume that all these adverts were the best of the best, excuse me, all these outfits were the best of the best and despite looking as if they were the same as any others they would have been very expensive made from the best materials from the brands with the highest value in terms of price and reputation. Perhaps even Simon Massey, as an article about the brand in June 1973 says, trousers were lined and made by tacking the sides together, the lining made from the same pattern as the trousers, then both put into the waistband at the same time after adjusting the waist studs to fit, they added, and then sewing up the sides and putting the hems on, which sounds really complicated, doesn't it? So despite looking simple, the crease holds along the front neatly and sharply, giving these trousers structure and form that shouts quality. If you'd like to see more about the changes that the 70s brought, you'll find it in our locations video on this channel. And perhaps inevitably or inevitable, because from the position of today, we know what was to come. Mirelle closed in 1978 in their last location in Hull and on 6th of July 1989, 11 years later, the Fulham Chronicle newspaper said that Simon Massey was insolvent. In other words, it had gone bust. Streets away, from number 8, 6 Upper Grosvenor Street, across New Bond and Regent Streets, on the other side of Carnaby near Wells, and the building once housing Susan Small Janice, however, was still very much going strong. It must have knocked them hard at Simon Massey to lose such a leader, such a firebrand. But her taste for luxury fabrics and meticulous worked designs took her forwards. She was reported as saying after she ran her own company that designing evening wear was the favourite thing to do and she thought that women would save up for an item if they really wanted it, paying for her prices. But it was an unmistakable rift that the brand responded to in the best way they could. But fashion was unfortunately already changing with the casual look of the era, as we can see from this fashion show. Janice Wainwright died on the 3rd of June 2023. One eBay seller commenting to me that she knew someone who went to her funeral. When I visited London around the same time to start making a film about fashion house locations, I walked up Poland Street to find where the building once stood and gawped. There in the road was this gap, a square building-sized hole, buttressed with steels and builders' awnings, where number 47 Poland Street used to be. Tall, white buildings surrounded me as I walked from 6 Upper Grosvenor Street through to Poland, 
comforted that they were still there, thinking of the memories of fifties models and leaves brushing the sky. When I arrived, I blinked for a few moments at the ability to erase the past by dismantling what contained it, wondering if the building talked as they took it down, giving up some secrets of the world Janice Wainwright occupied. I took a few photos and thought of the years and years Simon Massey was training and the legacy each outfit you've seen here reflects. Janice Wainwright really was a change maker, but if it hadn't been for Simon Massey, would she also have been so known as another very British brand? We've come to the end of part two of our story and would like to thank all of you lovely subscribers for making this such an enjoyable story to tell and illustrate. And if you've got this far, why not subscribe? It's completely free. And if you also give us a thumbs up, it really helps our channel. And thanks to everyone, new friends, contributors, and even people who worked and shopped there for sticking around and learning about the fashion house that existed in the Yorkshire city of Hull for 40 years. <laughs>